This episode was brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for business. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome to Unstoppable today, Kylie Watson-Wheeler, who is a Senior Vice President and Managing Director of the Walt Disney Company, Australia and New Zealand. This lady is action-packed. Let me tell you, she's responsible for all areas of the business, encompassing film, media, streaming, consumer products, digital, home entertainment, distribution, as well as the management of the TV, of the group's TV's channels. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to Unstoppable, Kylie Watson-Wheeler. Thank you for coming on, Kylie. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now, you're a powerhouse. You're not only, you know, the Australasian guru of Walt Disney. You're also, as I've just found out, the club president for Western Bulldogs, which is, I was looking at your face going, where have I seen your face recently before? Uh, and it was a, a, an article to do with that, I'm sure. But it's a great honor and a great pleasure to have you here. So thanks for being on. It's my absolute pleasure. I'm looking forward to our chat. Yeah, likewise. Now, you have quite the pedigree um, when it comes to marketing in, especially in the area of media. And when I look at your story, you know, you've got more than 15 years experience working through just with Disney throughout multiple areas of the business. Um, you've previously worked with Dis uh, Walt Disney Publishing World worldwide. <clears throat> you started your career in Disney in 2004, where you were the director of advertising and brand management for Hallmark Cards based in Kansas City in the US. So you've kind of been anywhere and everywhere. But when you look at your life and your journey, where does it begin for you? Look, it's really interesting because, you know, I'm a great believer in following your passion, but I do think that sometimes you don't necessarily know what that passion is and it takes time yeah. uh, to discover that. But I think for me, everything, every decision that I made early in my career was really linked to my love of creativity. And it doesn't necessarily, from, from that perspective, I don't necessarily mean creating art, but being involved in organisations where creativity was at its centre. So I found that I nat naturally oscillated uh, to opportunities as a result of that. And even if I think right back to, um, you know, my uni days and, and what I started studying, I, I did a Bachelor of Arts in Politics and English because I thought that that would be interesting and uh, English was my strength, but I was really missing something. I was missing that, um, that ability to use the creative side of my brain when I finished my degree, I ended up doing a postgrad in publicity. So I ended up starting my career as a publicist, which is not the usual starting point for a CEO. <laughs> but, no. um, I think that that's a quite a unique, um, unique entry point. But for me, that was where I could really, you know, stretch my, my mind and think outside the box and really find and explore unique ways of doing things, which I think really is the undercurrent of, of my career and, and generally why I've oscillated to where I have gone. But, you know, you mentioned Penguin, uh, you know, Penguin Books was, was um, the first company that I worked for um, as a children's publicist there. So I, I really love publishing, but, you know, it's creative storytelling. Um, and then certainly my time at Hallmark, you know, greeting card company, you know, it's one of the, the most amazing things when I worked at Hallmark in the US was I would walk through the halls and there's all these little, um, you know, tiny desks with these most amazing artists in the world sitting there drawing greeting cards. <laughs> it's really quite astounding, but such an incredibly creative business and company. And so I was really motivated and inspired by that. And another thing too, though, I think that, that has really shaped me following my creative heart is I've always lent into brands that are meaningful to me. So every company that I've worked for, I've generally chosen the brand over the job. And that's because I found I've had some kind of emotional connection with that brand or with what it is that that company is actually doing. And that's enabled me to really, you know, flush out my creativity as a result of that, because there's that emotional connection um, and an alignment between me and, and what the company is, is trying to achieve. So from Penguin's um, kids' books to Disney, that's quite the trajectory. And But there's a level of alignment there. You're still obviously telling stories. You, 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 you've got probably one of the best or the biggest storytelling brands on the planet that you work for. How do you maintain a level of creativity or how do you bring creativity to the table in an organization that is based on, you know, probably one of the most creative concepts when it comes to entertainment that, you know, that we've seen in the last... Uh, what is it, 60, 70, 80 years now? It's probably even more. How long has Disney been around? Oh, this is yeah, embarrassing. It's, it's nearly 100. So we're, we're fast approaching our, our 100th anniversary. anniversary. Dear it's, God. It's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, look, I think, I think that, I mean, obviously, 
to date, the, the content that our company creates is, you know, the best creatively in the world. And yep. then, you know, it's, it's brought to us as a local market to commercialise that content and monetize it through all of the different lenses that you mentioned before that, that our business oversees. But I think the real opportunity is to think about how we do that, how we bring that content to market. And a really important component of that for us locally here is a strategy that we've been um, operating uh, for the last five years, and it's what we call our local and loved strategy, and it really applies to everything that we do across the business. And the context of that is that we take the amazing content that our, our parent brings to us and we put that local lens over it to determine how we create a deeper, more emotional connection with our local audiences. And that requires an enormous amount of creativity. And I have some of the best out-of-the-box thinkers going around in our team because that's what's really encouraged and really supported. Um, there's a real openness to try unusual things, uh, to, try, to try things that we've never done before. Um, hopefully, if we're going to fail, fail fast and quickly move on. But there's a real encouragement here as a business to really think outside the box and be prepared to push the boundaries and reinvent you know, the way in which we, we um, execute our business. So it's not, we, we certainly do not have in any way a cookie cutter approach. And as a result, we get a lot of opportunities brought to us here. So we were the first market in the world outside of the US to launch Disney Plus, our streaming platform. Um, we were able to, we're the only country in the world that has a naming rights sponsorship of a, of a stadium with Marvel Stadium. So we, we, as a result, managed to deliver a lot of first here, but it's really through that local and love strategy that enables that. And uh, I have to say, I really love what you've done with The Mandalorian, um, the way you brought Star Wars back uh, to life with that production. And also, as I guess you could say, as a catch-all, because it really was a compelling piece of content to bring people on onto the platform. How have you navigated the world of streaming? Because obviously, when you look at you know where Disney's roots are, a lot of Disney's roots are in entertainment feature films, cartoons. Um, but now, the the landscape for distribution has changed so radically. The landscape for pro content creation has changed so dramatically. How do you find yourself in the center of this, especially somewhere like in Australia, navigating you know, the different taste types and, and styles of content that are coming out when there's just so much content to choose from? Well, one of the most exciting things about my journey at Disney and, and has seen me you know, remain and evolve um, at the company over um, all of these years is that our business is really progressive. So over all that time, you know, if I think about what Disney was when I started here, you know, 17, nearly 18 years ago, wow. um, we were primarily Disney and we dis distributed Pixar. And since then, over that time, we acquired Pixar, we acquired Marvel, we acquired Lucasfilm, which obviously is Star Wars, and then most recently acquired Fox Studios. So when you think about the evolution of the business from a content mm. perspective over that time, it's really actually in our DNA. It's how we operate. Uh, it's how we work. So I think in the context of that, there's a real openness always to determine what's next and how do we reach a broader audience, but how do we make all of those elements fit together as well? But a key component in relation to streaming is that the, the exciting part about streaming is, as you mentioned, not only has it changed how content is distributed, but it's also really changed how people view content yeah. and what they expect. And, you know, something that, that streaming has really changed is this requirement uh, of consumers for consistent and constant new content, uh, which is not necessarily how, how it worked before. You know, you might, as a, as a studio, release 12 big, amazing films throughout the year and people waited for them and then they watched them throughout their content life cycle. Um, through different means but now there's this whole mindset that I want something new every week every day um, and so from that perspective there's a real you know shift and an openness I, I think you know that was certainly one of the benefits of, of our business acquiring Fox Studios and the real breadth of content that enabled us to launch Star on our platform which is our general entertainment component you know which which features everything right up to R-rated films, um, obviously with with very strong parental controls to ensure that a family um, audience is is not being concerned by that. But it's really enabled us to create that true breadth of content. But on top of that, it's also opened the opportunity for us to create content locally, which is not something yeah. that we've ever done before, and it's created this whole new lens for that.
is this, is that a big part of the strategy for the platform to do to producing and creating local content? Because it seems to me when you look at you know especially Disney Plus as a platform, you guys are a behemoth even as a company, even bigger. Um, how do you find a point of difference in a market where there seems to be new streaming services that are popping up, almost like social media networks were you know back in two thousand eight two thousand nine? Well, I think that uh, you know from a from a local content perspective what it really does is it enables us to round out the platform. So there's no question our parent company is creating, you know, some of the absolutely best content available in the world. It's all of of scale. And as a result of that, it all takes a lot of time to create. The opportunity for us to add local content really gives us two opportunities. One is it enables us to find and source and create content that is specifically relevant to this market. So we can, we can look through that lens. But it also enables us to look at content from a, a breadth of, of, you know, everything from, you know, high quality, uh, high price tag dramas uh, right down to family friendly factual entertainment that's relevant to audiences here. So it gives us an opportunity to really explore multiple different areas of, of content locally here. And, you know, one of the things that, that is amazing is that our um, industry here is phenomenal it's absolutely world class Mm. Uh, right from from writers right through to production right through to behind the scenes Um, you know we have the most amazing talent here and the studios in the US know that too so there's also a real desire to film more here as well we've just finished filming back-to-back Marvel films at our Fox studio lot in Sydney and certainly our intention is to do more of that as well so there's that that double um, opportunity of mm. global content being filmed here on behalf of our company and local content being created and, and commissioned by us from the local. Uh, this might sound like a big question, but you know, if there's someone, if there was a you know, local talent that were listening to this and they were going, wow, okay, you guys are looking to develop more of a local lens. What are you looking for? And I guess that's a big open question that everyone would ask. And there's no magic formula necessarily, although there might be. But when you look at what you guys are looking for, what are you looking for when it comes to local content in Australia, as an example? Well, as I mentioned before about our industry being world class here, yeah. from my perspective, you know, we're definitely looking for content that has that local relevance and local feel, but also has the ability to, um, you know, air internationally. And so from that perspective, you know, really trying to find Australian stories um, or Australian storytelling that has that real global or international resonance. Yeah, right. Okay. And are you seeing uh, like a, a lot of opportunity available for that content coming through already? Or is there is there a real need for that content to be produced at the moment? There's definitely a, a lot of ideas out there and a lot of great stories yeah. um, and some really good content. Uh, so there's lots of opportunities for us to convert that into actual production. So as a female CEO, I can only assume being in an industry, you know, that has been dominated by, you know, um, men for a very long time, you've risen to the ranks that very few people have been able to achieve. What have been, and but the, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, you seem to have a real strong feminine presence to yourself. You don't seem like someone who's, although I dare say if I caught you at a bad day, you, you could probably <laughs> defy that. But how have you managed as a woman? And I guess you're probably sick of this question, but I, I was brought up by a mum a single mum on a pension. And so I had a very strong, you know, female influence throughout my life. And I've always admired strong female figures, especially those who've been able to go into industries that have been dominated, you know, by other sexes and be able to make their mark. What has been some of the biggest lessons that you've learned around maintaining who you are, I guess you could say as a woman, but at the same time being able to lead or learn to lead at the level that you now are now able to? Well, I think for me, I've definitely remained in companies that are supportive of me and my style. So there has been, you know, one time where I worked for a business where I didn't feel that that there would be opportunity for me to progress, you know, based on my own personal style. And that's no, no slur against the business itself. Um, it just, there, it wasn't, I was not a cultural fit for that business. So generally what I found is that where I've landed in companies and, and Hallmark and Disney are the perfect examples of that, where there's a real authentic cultural fit between the business and my own values, then I've just been able to be myself and I've been able to uh, present myself in a, in a way that's, that's comfortable and authentic and that has been valued in both companies and, and as a result saw me progress throughout the ranks. 
I think any company where I had to try to create a falsehood of, of who I was or what I represented or what I stood for, I think I would find that very difficult. And then in turn, that business would probably not necessarily value me and promote me. So one of the things that's been really important to me has always been that alignment uh, between my own values and the values of the company. But then if I look through the personal lens um, as well, I guess one of the things that I do think is really important is that, you know, I have built my confidence and my bravery over time. And I wasn't necessarily like that in the beginning, but it took time for me to push the boundaries a little and achieve a result that then gave me confidence to push the boundary a little bit more. And so I think from that perspective too, you know, building confidence in myself over time has opened up lots of opportunities for me because as that confidence has come, you know, aligned with my authentic viewpoint of, of how I see myself connecting within the business has really ensured that, that I've progressed well throughout the ranks. Although I guess another thing though is that one of the things that that I talk about a bit within our business here, and I don't necessarily see a lot, is people's willingness to move laterally. Um, I do think that there's there's a mindset for a lot of people that you know they need to keep taking those steps up within the organisation. But I worked all over the Walt Disney Company um, in the last 18 years, and sometimes I took a step back. So sometimes I took a, a less senior role to learn, and as a result, I really built a strong portfolio. Um, it doesn't really ask, answer your question as far as me being a woman, but I think, you know, more no. from the perspective of just being myself. Um, and I never really overthink the fact that, that I'm female in this, in this role. I'm, I'm just me and I, and I do it the best of my ability. Yeah. And I, I, I sometimes think those, those questions get, that get done to death, but I, I am someone though, who is actually genuinely curious your organization. How many people are you leading in the organization currently? Uh, there's about 260 of us here. 260. So that's a that's a that's a big roster for any coach. It's a big roster for any leader. Um, I'm going to assume throughout the process of the last let's call it 15 years working at Disney, you've worked at a range of different levels of management and a range of different levels of leadership. What have been some of the key lessons that you have learned as a leader? And let's take the male female aspect out of it. You have had to learn how to lead at a you know a very successful organisation at scale on a global level with a lot of eyes looking at you. What have been some of the biggest lessons that you've taken away that someone else could learn from you? Well, my number one lesson is your reputation is everything. And that's internally with your peers, with your staff, with the people that are more senior to you and with your partners externally. So that's one of the things that, that I think is the most important um, and, and maintaining and valuing your reputation is, is really key, how people see you. Um, you know, I talk a lot uh, about perception being reality and you know because some people might have a perception out there and they think well I'm not really like that but if that's how people see you then that's how you will be perceived and that can hold you back so I think that's something that's that's really important um, the other thing too I think particularly if you are a leader and it's whether or not you're a leader of a team within that big organization or the total organization is being really clear on what the objectives are um, and what it is that the business is seeking to achieve. And something that I always do and have always done is that whenever I have worked on the strategy uh, for either my area of business or the overarching business, I work out a way to drill it down to be simplified. And obviously there's a complex version always of a strategy of a company of this size, but I always make sure that there's a version that everyone, regardless of their role, in the business can read and see and understand and lean into. Because I think one of the things that is the most important in an organization, uh, particularly one of scale, is that everyone is, is running in the one direction. Uh, we talk a lot here about linking arms and, um, and ensuring that we're all working towards the same goal. And we went through an evolution quite a few years ago where we were bringing a lot of individual lines of business together under one. And so we were breaking down silos, which is always a very, very difficult and challenging thing. We also integrated, you know, we've integrated businesses throughout that time, really large businesses, bringing them into our fold. So ensuring that we're creating ways and language that talks about, um, you know, the sum is greater than the parts, um, all boats must rise, all those types of things that, that have become my, my little uh, catch cry. All the cliche I statements. Um, I probably get eye rolls when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> I say them so often, but it's really true. And it truly is the secret 
to our success that, you know, ensuring that everyone is on the bus and we're all driving in the one direction and, you know, we absolutely amplify our results as a result of that. Is leadership you've something, something you've ever had to work out or has it always come quite natural to you? Well, I think elements have, have come natural, but I've certainly learned a lot on the journey. And I do think that from the leaders above you, sometimes you learn what to do and sometimes you learn yeah. what not to do. I mean, we've all had great people who we reported to and, and who are our leaders. And, and I'm sure most of us have had people who were challenging and difficult. And in those times, I've generally focused on, in my own mind, why I think why why I, I don't enjoy working for them and what are the own, what are the lessons that I can learn from that. So I think there's a, a, a leadership foundation for me, but I've certainly honed that and added to that on my journey. And I'm going to assume at, at the scale you're at, you're dealing with a range of different levels of management. When it comes to enrolling people, I'm going to assume 260 people, 260 perspectives. Everyone's aligned from a values perspective for the most part, but every now and then you're going to get people that aren't. So how do you deal with situations where you've got, whether it be you know low, senior, middle, you've got people that are in conflict around a particular direction when you perhaps might know what is the right decision to make, but you've got someone that's resistance to that. How do you bring people with you, whether it's one people or an entire team? Is there, do you have a go-to strategy in your playbook? Well, one of the things that I have learned over time is that there's not really a cookie cutter approach to leadership, particularly one-on-one leadership. So if you're leading an individual and one of the things that I've certainly found is that I have, have grown to, and this sounds horrible because it sounds like you're treating your children differently, but I have grown to understand <laughs> yeah. the nuances between each of my, and this, and primarily it's my direct reports because it's, yeah. it's my direct reports role to, to deal with any challenges within their own ranks. But if I look at my direct reports, um, there are some that I need to go gently, gently and take them on the journey and kind of talk them through and, and be delicate. And there are others I need to hit over the head with a, with a sledgehammer. And I think, mm learning that and understanding that that people need to be led differently um, I think can really help your success as a leader because it means that you're talking to those people in their own language because otherwise you know my language might not actually even make sense to one of my staff members and everything I'm saying might be completely going right through to the keeper because it's it's not something that they relate to or understand but trying to find that common ground or that point of understanding um, to really help them recognise why it is that we're doing what we're doing. So I think, you know, I, I think that's always really important. I think the why is important. Mm. Um, here's why I need you to link arms. Here's why I need you to be partnering with this team. This is why we do this here. And here's, here's the results that we've achieved, achieved because of that. So it's not just I want you to do this because I said so. It's, there's an actual reason and there's a demonstration of, of reward for doing it that way. Planning. Um, some businesses do it really well. Some people businesses don't. Some businesses succeed by accident. You look at Toyota; they have like a four hundred year plan. How pivotal is planning in the process that you use to lead uh, at Walt Disney? Well, there's two parts to it. I mean, we certainly do a five year plan every year as a Walt Disney company, so we, right. we do a, a local version of that to feed up into the global um, strategy, but. We're at this moment in time where there's this long-term and short-term that's intersecting. Because we're working in a space that is evolving and changing so quickly, we need to be agile. And so our five-year plans are more, I guess, to demonstrate directionally where we're going. But each year, we're certainly making fairly major adjustments to that. Last year is a perfect example through COVID. Uh, you know, I would say that the streaming part of the business accelerated to probably five years earlier than we thought it would, given yeah, right. um, you know, the changes that have happened. And there's many knock-on effects to that. So it's not just about how many subscribers you're bringing in and, and who's watching that, but how does that impact other parts of your business and the ways that you've previously worked and how your team works as a result of that. And one of the things through through COVID that happened to us is that, you know, we, we obviously were not releasing any films. We've got this massive film distribution and marketing team. And we literally said to them, you know, for the moment, you don't work in in cinema distribution and and cinema marketing anymore. Now you work in streaming. Get on board and and adapt. And we had some of the most phenomenal results ever because people just pivoted and lent right in. And as a result, now there's this much more inclusive 
feeling of where we're going rather than, oh, it's the studio team over there and the stream, streaming team over there. Now we truly are one and we're all working towards that together. So you you found that the, 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 the pivot that COVID induced actually brought your team together, made the business a lot stronger overall? Absolutely. So many businesses. And I, and I think, are, and I think we learned a lot of ways of working that we had never even thought of before that we will most definitely continue. That's incredible. Um, in terms of investing locally, are you guys investing locally when it comes to studio development as well, or is it just content? Because I know there's a lot of studios be- popping up on the East Coast. We've just built one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we already have one. So we've got our um, Fox Studios in, in Of Sydney, course, so, yep. But um, are you guys investing more like uh, in terms of developing more assets on on the ground here to develop more content? Well, as far as physical space, it really depends on on what's required and right. – uh, for the business, and of course, we're in a we're in a time of evolution in that space, determining what we need globally and what we also need locally. Uh, so, you know, our our minds are open to that, but you know, obviously, there's there's a, a mathematical formula that goes with acquiring yeah. a space like that and ensuring yeah. that you can fill it with content uh, consistently. So, um, you know, we, as I said, we have an open mind, but it's great that we already have this working yeah. operating studio lot that's one of the biggest. Uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. so In the most fun. attractive country to film in the world right now. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I'm going to assume, you know, with the amount of years that you've spent doing what you're doing, it, it, you know, someone's business uh, ethic or their their business success is never in isolation of, you know, other things in their life. So I'm just curious from your perspective, like how have you managed the 360 degrees that there is of life? Because you've clearly been very successful, you know, as an executive in a whole range of different functions in a whole range of very different, you know, large multinationals. But how have you managed the other side of life, the personal side and integrating, you know, a successful or a, even a personal life, whether it be, you know, relationships and health with the other side, which is, you know, the incredible career that you've created for yourself? I have an 18-year-old son and a 15-year-old daughter and I have been married for a quarter of a century. <laughs> <laughs> Holy smokes. That's a long time. I know. I know. It's a really, really long time. Um, <laughs> look, I, I think for me, I think this kind of ties into this, this whole idea of, of what I've chosen to do in my career is really true to me because as a result then that bleeds into my personal life as well so the two then therefore have never truly been separate and I think one of the benefits for me is that you know when you work for the Walt Disney Company it's a pretty exciting place for your mum to work and and it's pretty interesting and one of the things that I have said to my son who was one when I started at Disney that we have acquired all of these new studios just to keep him engaged because every time <laughs> it's, it's a certain age milestone mm-hmm. um, that, uh, that, you know, we, we acquire something new that's appealing to him. But, um, you know, I think that's, been, that's really helped me that I, I talk about my work at home. Um, I involve my kids in, in what I'm doing. Uh, I, you know, I tell them about exciting things that's coming down the road. Uh, my son is currently studying at Swinburne and, uh, Cinema and Screen Studies. So he's, yeah, wow. he's, he's been certainly interested and engaged. But, you know, it's, it doesn't mean that, it's been all rosy, you know, particularly when my kids were quite little and I was running publishing for the region. I had to travel a lot and that was really, really hard. So there were there were times where it was really difficult and there's big chunks of time I don't remember. Like I have no no recall of because it was so wow. intense. But I do remember one time talking to my son and I'm, I'm going to say maybe he was about five and I was going to Indonesia the next day and I said to him, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm flying out in the morning and and he said, oh, I wish you didn't have to go, mum. And I said, oh, I wish I didn't have to go too. But if I if I don't go, then I don't work for Disney anymore. And he's like, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's gold. <laughs> Nothing like a collaborative family effort uh, yeah. when it comes to chasing down big goals. Parenting and leadership. Um, you know, I've often heard CEOs refer to, you know, ingest their businesses as adult daycare centres. And, you know, see many correlations between, you know, being the parent of one or two children or being, you know, the leader of one or two direct reports or 260 within their team. Have you found that there have been lessons that you've taken from one to the other? Yeah, I do think the the being the, the parental referee uh, that has, has certainly raised its head um, over time where, you know, you recognise you've got, you've got two staff members who perhaps are um, 
in inverted commas, fighting and, uh, you know, how you kind of come in and broker a, um, a commonality between the two and, and break things up. That's certainly something that, that I have done many, many times in my personal life as well um, at different times over the years when my kids were, were at certain, certain age and stage moments in time. Um, but, look, I, I do think that, that there is a seamless... I, I actually like the idea of thinking about your life as, as one whole piece. It's not necessarily, you know, you work and your work persona and, and your home and your home persona. I do remember early in my career, I, I did feel like sometimes I had to be work highly and home highly, but I did learn that really keeping that person the same um, was, mm. was much more valuable and, and much more authentic than in both spaces rather than trying to put a, a different hat on each time. But one of the, that certainly bled into the way in which I, I see my team. And one of the things that we think about you know, in our organisation here is, is definitely about the whole person and it's not just about, uh, you know, the work that they do for us here but it's who they are and the family that they have and the interests that they have and, you know, we lean into a lot of social initiatives and issues here because it's important to our team and so we want to be reflective of them as well. So I think, I think the way in which I have seen myself in the context of that, I try to also give the team the opportunity to, to be the same way. And when it comes to performance, um, you know, there's that many different books and seminars out there that talk about how to get the best out of a team. You know, oftentimes we're told that extrinsic rewards are short term and they are, don't really provide consistent performance over time. And so sometimes I think as a leader, it can be very confusing as to how we reward people based on the effects that those rewards, whether it's creating entitlement or resentment, when it comes to rewarding performance um, with the goal of creating, you know, greater levels of performance. How do you typically gone about doing that with the people who are close to you? I think the thing that that has the biggest impact is recognition and acknowledgement. Mm. Uh, I think that if you've got people who are peddling incredibly hard and fast, and no one actually ever stops to say, "Hey, you're doing an absolutely amazing job," um, and congratulations on achieving that I think if you if you give a you know an amount of money at the end of the year I don't know maybe doesn't feel I mean I'm sure it's appreciated but I don't necessarily think it has that consistency of fueling people's um, enthusiasm and engagement so I definitely think providing credit where credit is due is really important showcasing people's work um, I do a, 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 a fortnightly you know five minute video that I send out to the team and and you know our comms team make sure that they're talking to all areas of the business so that we're we're representing all areas and, and what they're doing and so they get a call out and a shout out uh, and I'm showcasing to the rest of the business what they're doing so I think that's really important too so I really think at the core of it it's making people feel valued mm. and appreciated and recognized for what they're doing and achieving for the business and so you do that five minute video was it once a fortnight did you say yeah, through COVID, I did it every week. So, yep. okay, that's a nice touch. Did that <laughs> did. land well with the team? Well, I, I'm told it. I'm told it, it. It does, and it did, which is why I kept doing it. But I, I really just started. It was our first week that we were all in lockdown, and I just basically did a little video um, and said, "Hey, you know, we're all in this together. This in no way is ideal. Uh, you know, we commit to keeping you in the loop of you know what what's happening and what our plans are." And and then I got a positive reactions. So I did another one and then I did another one and nice. soon I did one every, every week for the whole year. And yeah, we've cut, we've seen that we're, you know, we're half in half out at the moment from a, an office perspective. I figured that probably weekly might be a bit much now. So, so every okay. second week is what they're getting. Just out of curiosity, did you have a COVID moment? Uh, and what I ref mean by that is a moment where, you know, where, because I, I found that everyone had a COVID moment at some point, depending on some level of pressure or stress or stimulus or information where, you know, individuals just went, holy fuck, what's going to happen next? Like, do you remember your COVID moment and how it actually affected you and how you dealt with it? It was actually right at the beginning. Right. And just the how fast everything happened and how I just could never have imagined in my wildest dreams that it would happen to us. Mm, yeah. All these things are happening because these things happen in other parts of the world. They don't happen here. And we were supposed to be having our, um, our biannual um, team meeting on the Monday. And so, you know, there'd been an enormous amount of planning and we we're already 
And then I remember talking to a head of strategy and CFO on the Friday night and he's saying, we're going to have to cancel um, at cancel our offsite. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? He's like, no, no, we'll have to cancel it. And so through that weekend, it went from me challenging him saying, that's ridiculous, we don't have to cancel it, to our office being closed yeah. and us not even going in the office. So I think for me that kind of weekend of gradual comprehension and understanding of what was happening um, and the reality of it, I mean, that's probably the moment where I just was completely, completely shocked. Did you ever reach a point of overwhelm? No, I don't think so. I think I think we um, as a team pivoted really quickly, as I mentioned. Yeah. There was also a lot of global support. I think the fact that our head office, you know, certainly was in the same boat with, but was very embracing of us working this way. So we were really empowered locally to do what we needed to do. Uh, and I guess probably the, the thing I worried at the most was, you know, we had just integrated the Fox business. So we'd moved mm. quite a few people down from Sydney to Melbourne. So we had quite a few um, single people that had just moved into a, a strange city in a one bedroom apartment. And so I was concerned for the team. I was concerned for people who were feeling isolated. I mean, I had, I had all my family around me. There was homeschooling going on in multiple rooms and, you know, <laughs> my husband on calls and me on calls and the dog. Um, it, was, it was certainly an, an interesting and vivacious time, but I, I recognised that there was a lot of people that that wasn't the case for them. So that was something that was really important for us, aside from ensuring that the business continuity happened, but making sure that all of our people were okay. And that mm. was part of the, the genesis for the videos in the beginning was just making sure that, that one way or another I was talking to them all um, throughout the, the, the time. Kylie, it seems like you guys have, um, you know, great feel and touch for what you're doing right now. There's a strong strategy in place for the brand. I'm curious about you though. Like, what's you? You seem to have done a lot uh, in the last 15 years with Disney, and you know, in your illustrious 20 plus year career, it's got to be more than 25 year career now. Where do you go from here? Like, it seems to me you're quite happy. Well, I, th I think as I mentioned earlier, the the reason I have have stayed at the business for so long, uh, apart from the fact that mm. I I love the brand um, and I love the values of the company, but also that there's always something new. There's always something exciting to to help the business evolve into. And as I mentioned before, you know we've just gone through this whole evolution of, of streaming, um, which will continue to to push and challenge us and require us to think outside the box. Um, and now, as I mentioned, with us us looking at and exploring local production um, in a meaningful way for the first time ever, that's incredibly exciting. And then, and then, mm. obviously, with my um, Bulldogs presidency as well, there's uh, plenty of exciting new things for me to focus on with my my two current roles. <laughs> and I got to ask the question because I know there's probably going to be a lot of people who are wishing that I do. How did you end up as the club president for the Western Bulldogs? Well, I'll, sh I'll, I'll share the, uh, the short edited version. I, I am a, a, a mad Bulldog supporter and have been my whole life. My parents were from um, the West in Melbourne and both my grandparents broke for the Bulldogs. And so it's really central to my family and, and, and what we represent and who we are. And I always went to the footy with my dad and my sister. So it was quite a well-known, it's quite well-known or always has been well-known that, that I am a doggy supporter. So I was asked a few years back to just help the club out. They needed some support from a marketing perspective. And you know, if you love the club, you just do it. So I just lent in and did it, which ultimately led me to being asked a few years later to join the board. And, uh, you know, I've been on the board for seven years now. I was the vice president, president for the last four. And Peter Gordon, who was the president before me, uh, yeah, he, he um, selected me you know, when he made me vice president, so about four years ago. Um, as ultimately his successor. So I've been apprenticing under him for the last few years. So what's been nice is that the transition uh, from him being club president, he'd been club president twice over the last couple of decades. And so you know, we actually haven't had many presidents in the last few years, but it was quite a seamless transition for us, which has been has been great. And, you know, the the results on the field are pretty good at the moment, which keeps everyone at bay and we can just <laughs> get on with what we need to do. Because, and I hope you don't mind me banging this drum again, but how many female club presidents have there been in the AFL? Well, when I when I was made president at the end of last year, I was only the second. So the first is Peggy O'Neill, who's the, the president of, um, of Richmond. But since I was made president, Kate Roffey has come on as the president of Melbourne. And so we're number we're, we're, we're number one on the ladder in, in Melbourne. Kate Roffey's team are number two, and we play them this Friday. So 
And have you found similar dynamics between the the corporate world and the sporting world, as a in in the leadership capacity? There's certainly similarities between my leadership team here and the leadership team at the Bulldogs. Uh, we have more females on our board than men. Um, and we have more females on our leadership team here at Disney than, than we have men. So there is, um, I guess, a real alignment from that perspective. But really the alignment is, is that in both instances, the leadership was brought together based on ensuring that we had a mix of talent across multiple disciplines. Mm. And so that mix has actually come about really organically as a result. But uh, both businesses are operating very well and successfully at the moment. Fantastic. Kylie, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, I'm going to assume just based on the nature of the beast that you're running, are you on social media? I am, yes. Where can people find out more about you if they want to find out more about Kylie Watson-Wheeler? Well, I, I actually have, well, I'm on social media, but I I'm probably have more of a private setting on, on my social media. <laughs> okay. Well, we won't direct people to your Instagram profile then. So, so LinkedIn, 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 LinkedIn is probably the best place. Fantastic. And um, best piece of advice that you've ever received that you find yourself still giving out for, to this day? Um, hmm, that's a really big question. You know, I think I would say always be true to yourself um, and trust your gut. And all of the times that I have gone against that advice and not mm. trusted my gut, I have always regretted it. And so obviously you scaffold with all of the extra information and the detail that you need to enhance and, and ensure that the decision that you're making is the right one. But generally it's fairly rare that regardless of any research I do, that it deviates from what I believed in my gut in the first place. Yeah, wow. I think there's a, a lot to be said about trusting the intuition. Kylie, I have I enjoyed this conversation a lot more than I thought I would, and I already thought I was going to enjoy it a lot. You're an incredibly inspiring woman. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. It's been great chatting. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Kylie Watson-Wheeler, and you've been listening to Unstoppable. This episode is brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for businesses. If you have ever wanted to grow your business faster than what you can right now, if you need to make more revenue, if you need more leads, if you need more clients, if you need to know how to plan your business in a strategic way in order to hit big goals, if you need to learn how to scale your business and grow your team and your business so that you have more freedom, then this program is for you. Imagine three days immersed with me where we cover all aspects of business, but we do it from an immersive, but also an execution standpoint. We execute every step of the way and we're looking at five key areas we're looking at your psychology we're looking at your marketing your sales your leadership and we're looking at your planning and how we integrate these five key areas to grow your business and your brand quickly so if you'd like to find out more information kerwinray.com